Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly McClear from Crime HQ, and tonight we have part two of our special series of Did They Do It with Dr. Nikki Jackson. So we've been taking a deep dive into the case against Daniel Holtzclaw. And if you haven't done so already, the case file uh, is linked out into the page on Crime HQ. So please do take a look at those if you haven't done so already. So tonight our speakers and our panelists are gonna be taking a deep dive into the evidence or lack thereof that was presented at the trial. And two guests are joining us tonight to break it all down. We have Erica Fuchs, who is a biologist from Iowa who made crucial discoveries about the DNA evidence in Daniel's case that his trial attorney and DNA expert had overlooked. Erica has a bachelor's degree in biology from Harvard and her master's in botany with a minor in biochemistry from Iowa State University. Daniel's case and the prosecution's misrepresentation of the DNA's evidence inspired Erica to find a nonprofit called Uncuff the Innocent in 2017, along with four former police officers and including exonerees Brian Franklin and Dr. Ray Spencer to help prevent and overturn wrongful convictions. And tonight, we also have private investigator Brian Bates. Brian is best known for his over 20 years of advocacy, highlighting organized prostitution and human sex trafficking through his website, johntv.com, and his YouTube channel. Now, Brian has been a licensed and bonded private investigator for the last decade. And in 2009, his investigative work garnered him a Heartland Regional Emmy, for his efforts to expose organized drug dealing in South Oklahoma City. The reason why he's here tonight is that in 2019, his podcast, Bates Investigates, has done an outstanding 32-part series entitled Oklahoma versus Daniel Holtzclaw, where he outlines each accuser. So if you haven't done so already, you're going to want to take a listen to the series. And of course, back tonight is Daniel's sister, Jenny. Jenny, welcome back. Thank you so much for your time. And of course, your host for the series is Dr. Nikki Jackson, who is a professor of criminal justice at the Purdue University Northwest and director for the Center of Justice and Post-Exoneration Assistance. So welcome everybody. And tonight we have so much to cover, but as a reminder, if you have a question or a comment for the panelists tonight, please type your comments uh, or put them in the Q&A tab and I will get to them as soon as possible. Now, I do have to acknowledge, that I can't let the night go by without acknowledging the tragedy that happened today in Uvalde, Texas. And so our thoughts and prayers are obviously with all of the victims and their families. So if it's okay with everybody, I would like to take just a quick moment of silence. Thank you so much, everybody. So we have a lot to cover tonight. So Dr. Jackson, the Crime HQ floor is yours. All right, well, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, so tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to spend the evening going over the timeline of events and the accusations that were made against Daniel. And we are also going to hear evidence about DNA um, which is not in my, my area of expertise, so I'm excited about hearing about the DNA evidence. But we're going to start, Jenny, with you. I'm going to just ask you some questions. Um, we'll start with the first question. What was TM's initial, oh, and I will say, all of the accusers will be um, addressed by their initials, okay? So everyone is on the same page. So TM was the first accuser. What was TM's initial allegation and how did it impact the entire investigation? Yeah, um, if you want to enable the um, screen, I can go and pull up the PowerPoint as well so we can have some visuals while we go through um, this discussion today. All right, let me pull it up real quick. All right. There we go. All right, so wrapping back up from the, our last week's conversation, um, the original person that had originally came forward was JL. She had made allegations of oral sodomy after Daniel had pulled her over for swerving on June 18th of 2014, right about 2 a.m., right when he got off of uh, his patrol um, hours. And what he had done, he had Pat searched her. He searched her car for drugs or alcohol. 
verify she appeared to um, was safe to drive and then he let her go with a verbal warning to take care of her lack of valid driver's license the next day. Um, and so that that kind of trickles down to where we'll go into TM's allegation, um, which is, let me pull it up because I'm wanting to make sure I state the actual correct facts of TM's um, allegation. So um, her, hers was, um, you know, originally when we had talked last week that jails is the allegation that actually sparked the investigation of onto Daniel. But what had happened a month prior to that, back in May, um, TM had made allegations on May 24th of 2014, several weeks before jails uh, um, initial allegation. Um, and then she, TM initially described Daniel um, as a, uh, initially had, sorry, let me go back. She initially described a date location and then the patrol car vehicle description was completely different. That did not match Daniel who he, who he had originally stopped on May 8th, which was two weeks prior than the date that she actually made the allegations against him. Um, and then what had happened was, which is interesting is another police officer that actually had a history of having sex with prostitutes has stopped TM before Daniel. And I don't know if Erica, if you want to chime in and, and include anything else with her um, allegations, please feel free to. Okay. Yeah. I think what's really important is that she didn't accuse Daniel right away. People often don't realize that her description of the suspect was very different and the timeline was not matching Daniel, but the police still persisted in trying to get her essentially to accuse Daniel. So they wanted her to talk with them. They used an informant to go find her. She didn't want to proceed with the, the prosecution. She actually signed a do not prosecute form and basically begged the detective, Detective Gregory, to just let her go and not continue to try to get her to make an allegation. But then after that, after JL made an allegation, she was then willing to look at a photo lineup, TM was, but even when she looked at the photo lineup, she did not pick Daniel. She at first said another officer was the one who she thought had sexually assaulted her. And then maybe Daniel, but she couldn't decide. That was actually June 24th, I believe. And at that time, Detective Gregory's report, police report, shows that he asked her whether she had been stopped at another location by this officer. And he mentioned the name Liberty Station Apartments. The reason he did that is he knew Daniel had stopped her on May 8th, but still TM did not change her allegation to match this location. It was only after JL made her allegation, it was in the news, and then detectives had learned that there was DNA on the fly of Daniel's pants. They wanted to get a sample from TM so they could compare. And they found her, she was in jail, July 10th it was, I believe. They went there and at that time she changed an allegation to more closely match the time when Daniel stopped her. So the whole way in which her allegation came about is really troubling because detectives steered her toward Daniel by leaking information and then questioning her when she was in this vulnerable position in jail, very much wanting rehab. That was something you could hear her asking the detective over and over again when he interviewed her as she was changing her allegation. Brian, you may have some comments about that too because you were the one I think who I first heard talk about how the detectives had fed her the information about where Daniel had actually stopped her. Yeah, it, there, there's a lot wrong with TM's allegations from the very beginning and the number of times that they change. Um, her, her picking a, the more common police car as opposed to the car that Daniel was actually driving. Um, and not only did she did she not pick out Daniel conclusively in the uh, photo lineup, but the police intentionally left out an officer who had actually pulled over and stopped Terry Morris at one point. And that officer actually had been fired at one point because he was soliciting prostitutes while on duty. And then he got his job back through binding arbitration. And they intentionally left his picture out, I think for fear that she would point him out instead of Daniel. Um, so there was a lot wrong there when we get to talking about the AVL here in a little bit. Um, there's mm -hmm. additional red flags in, in her allegations. Mm -hmm. Another point I could make about TM, which is important, and you've pointed that out, this out, Brian, is that 
because she did have a criminal background of drug use and prostitution, her allegation that detectives thought was valid against Daniel led them when they started soliciting allegations to focus on black women with histories of prostitution or drugs. So that's very important for understanding why detectives ended up thinking that this was the perfect victim description. So I'm going to move to my next question. How mm -hmm. did finding unknown female DNA on the fly of Daniel's pants impact the investigation after JL's allegations? Yeah, so in the last um, session, we had you know discussed about JL's allegations, and so her and her family gave contradictory descriptions of the events. Um, her suspect description was off. Her same kit test was negative. Um, the female DNA evidence on the fly of the pants led, de led detectives to believe that he was guilty of the sexual assaults. That's the part that became especially troubling, Dr. Jackson, because detectives believe there is no other explanation for the DNA than sexual contact. And so that's the reason they went and talked with TM to get her DNA to compare to an unknown female profile found on the fly of Daniel's pants. And then when they found that TM did not match that unknown female DNA profile, that inspired detectives to begin trying to find the person who matched that led them to solicit allegations from people they knew, particularly black women they knew Daniel had stopped. By looking at his police records. So that DNA on the fly of the pants had a huge impact, it really propelled the investigation by causing detectives to think Daniel was guilty, which then impacted the way they questioned women, sometimes leaking his name, encouraging them, telling them falsely that they had a tip that they'd been sexually assaulted. Well, before we even get to that, can you just tell us how they went, how did they find these other accusers? How did the police department find those accusers? Yeah. Brian, do you want to talk about sure. how they looked up to the police records Daniel had? Yeah, it, it's really kind of mind boggling the way they did this. They had an initial accuser and she is a black female. Um, then they, they, for whatever reason, circled back around uh, to TM. She's also a black female, um, but that's where a lot of their similarities um, diverge. Um, they went from TM and almost right away, you start to see this one edition that they copy and paste over and over again in all the police reports where it said that they were provided with a, a list, a quote unquote list that they would later in court deny a list ever existed. And what they did is they initially ran all the names, everyone that, that Daniel had called in um, through the system because he had confronted them, pulled them over, whatever. They ran all those names. Well, they found out that Daniel was a very proactive officer. He stopped a lot of individuals, all different ethnicities, all different backgrounds. So for whatever reason, even only having just JL and TM as your possible accusers, they decided that they would develop a profile from that. And the profile was a black female with a history of drugs and prostitution. Um, how they got there, they could never explain. At trial, they could never explain. As a matter of fact, they went so far as to say this list doesn't exist. But they took this very extensive list and said, we have to, we have to funnel this down. So we're going to make it just black females with a history of prostitution and drugs, we know that Daniel had contact with these women. So this is our list. Now we're going to start contacting these women and we're not going to come to him and say, hey, has anything ever happened that, you know, you would like to share with the police report a crime that was perpetrated on you? No, time and time again, they went to these women and they said, we know that you are a victim of a sexual assault by an Oklahoma City police officer. Now tell us about it. And that's how they did it time and time again. And there is nothing fair. There is nothing impartial about that. It really became a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then they used the excuse of the DNA on the pants to give longevity to their investigation. Had this investigation gone on for another year, I bet they could have found another half a dozen, another dozen women mm -hmm. that would have lockstep right along with these allegations. Because people have to understand initially there were over 20 accusers and then they got most of those to admit that they had lied and so they whittled it down to 13 even with that 13 which we'll talk about when we talk about AVL with TM the prosecution knew they were lying before it ever went to trial and they admitted under oath that they knew that the accuser was lying um, but back to your question they, they literally just 
developed this profile without any evidence and then went to those individuals. And if they found an individual that was willing to say that an officer did something to them, then they would include that in their pot. And, and what is really interesting about approaching these women is before Daniel was identified on the news and his picture was shown on the news, the descriptions the women gave were way off from what Daniel actually looked like. The moment Daniel's face is put on the news and everybody knows that there's an officer now accused of very specific crimes, all of a sudden the women who are contacted after that point have a much more accurate description and they start to have allegations that start falling in line to the initial accusers. And, that, and I think that's very important in the timeline. Dr. Jackson, I wanna jump in by pointing out not only did the DNA evidence like Brian said, inspire the investigation to lengthen as they continue to question person after person after person trying to find the match to an unknown female DNA profile, but it was realized after Daniel's conviction that the DNA evidence actually impacted the investigation in another way. According to the testimony of Detective Davis's partner, who was Detective Holman, she testified in Daniel's predetermination hearing, which led to his firing. She said that the DA's office told the detectives to stop using photo lineups. Remember, TM was the only one shown a photo lineup. After that, no one was shown a photo lineup. And the reason they were told to stop them is because they had female DNA on the pants. So apparently they thought it just meant so much that Daniel was guilty that it warranted just asking person after person, even if those people couldn't recognize Daniel or couldn't pick him out of a photo lineup if they'd been shown one. Um, Kelly, thank you so much, Erica. Kelly, mm -hmm. do we have a question? Sorry, it takes me a second to turn myself back on. That's okay. So, <laughs> question pop up. Yeah, you know, it's a really good question, you know, and this is something I, I would want to know as well. Even if there is unknown female DNA um, from sexual contact, he could have just cheated on his girlfriend, right? It's kind of a big leap to assume that it was from a sexual assault. And, you know, that was never looked at, right? I mean, he would never admit that, you know, yes, you know, I had a sexual encounter. Maybe he did, you know, who knows? So where did this big jump come from? The detectives actually did ask Daniel during his interrogation, I believe, if he had ever cheated on his girlfriend. He said no. And they did acquire his girlfriend's DNA and it didn't match. So I think it was just their hunch that, well, if there's unknown female DNA and we have these two allegations we think he's guilty of, there must be some other one who's a victim who matches the DNA. And that was let's, the reason they can Let's go to the, let's well, hang tight for a few minutes on more information on the DNA. I actually want to jump back if we can to something Brian actually spoke about a few minutes ago, and that was the AVL. Can you first of all tell everybody what AVL is? What is an AVL? In easiest layman terms, AVL is GPS. Um, we all are familiar with kind of our phones or GPS. We can locate items. We can locate friends and family, things like that. AVL is very similar. It stands for Automatic Vehicle Locator. Um, this technology was installed in their cars um, back on June 10th of, I believe it was 08. Um, so it had been around for about six years by the time these allegations against Daniel came up. And what it is, if you think of it in terms of GPS, when an officer gets in their vehicle and they log on to the system, the little computers that we've all seen inside of a patrol car, when they log into all of that, it automatically turns on the GPS system. So it's not an independent system that an officer can turn off and on. And what happens is it pings. I think we're all familiar with the word pinging. It, it pings the, not the officer's location, but the vehicle's location, because it's located in the trunk of the patrol car. It pings its location every five seconds when the vehicle is moving. So if your vehicle is driving, it pings it or it asks for its location and its speed every five seconds. If when it pings it and the vehicle has come to a stop, it will now wait five minutes before it pings it again, um, unless there's some other activity, like it starts to move, um, they lose contact with the vehicle, something like that. But to keep it simple, every five seconds, it pings the location and speed of the vehicle. It, it does the vehicle speed in knots. So if anyone's looking over the evidence and they see the numbers, those speed numbers are actually in knots. I don't know why, but they chose knots over miles per hour, um, which is a little faster than miles per hour. I think it's 1.1 um, to every mile per hour. But anyway, and then if the vehicle comes to a stop, 
you're just not going to see anything. There's not going to be a ping unless the vehicle starts moving again or the timer hits five minutes. Once it hits five minutes, then you'll get a zero speed. And the other thing important to note is it goes, it, it pings the location based on a grid or a map. And it's based on city streets. So if someone goes into a field or goes up onto someone's property, it's going to snap to the nearest public street or what you would see on a map. That's where it's going to ping to. And for whatever reason, the not only did the prosecution really cling to AVL, but the public, um, just like the DNA, I think totally misinterpreted what its importance was in this case. So just so I better understand this AVL, when an officer gets to the station and they, they start their shift, is that when they turn on this AVL? And then when did they turn it off? Well, it, it's all independent on the officer. They can turn it off and on or wherever they want to. Now, prior to um, a chief's directive going out, um, which was in, I think, February of 2014, officers kind of turned it off and on at will. Now, there was a, a, a policy out there that you're supposed to, anytime you're in the vehicle, you're supposed to be logged on, and that means the AVL is going to come on, and that way you could take a call, even if you were off duty, but a, a mass shooting happens or something like that happens, you would get the call, you would know about it, and it's also for officer safety. But so many officers were turning off their AVL at the end of their shift that they finally sent out what's called a chief's directive. Instead of just sending out a general email, the chief is saying, okay, guys, cut it out. Um, you've got to start turning your AVLs back on. So at trial, it came up and, and the, Kim Davis was asked, look through all of Daniel's records and tell us one time that Daniel didn't turn off his AVL at the end of his shift and then turn it back on at the beginning of his shift. She couldn't find any. They were really trying to make it nefarious that Daniel had turned off his AVL right before he stopped JL. But when you actually look at his entire career, that was just something he did. He always turned it off when he got off shift. He always turned it back on when he came back on shift. So that is something that the officers control independently. So do, do we know why Daniel turned it off as soon as he was off shift? Well, yeah, his, his uh, reasoning whenever he was interrogated and when he spoke with me, I, I spent hundreds of hours talking with Daniel because I was on his trial defense team. And he said that was just what he did because he saw other officers do it. And he had worked a long shift. He got off. He didn't want to listen to the radio because tends to what all you're going to hear is a whole bunch of officers calling in other people. And he, he didn't want to listen to shop after he just got done putting in a long shift. So at the end of his shift, he would turn his radio off. And, and in this incident with JL, the one that's sort of the sort of the keystone accuser in all of this, he literally, you see it on the on the GPS or on the AVL mapping, he turns off his AVL probably about a minute, maybe minute and a half um, before he goes to pull JL over. And we know that he turned his AVL off before he would have had visual contact with JL. So this wasn't something that was done on purpose. It was literally something he did at the end of every single shift. So that's really important to know. It's that's very important. Very, and very the prosecution important. knew this, but this was part of their narrative. They knew, they knew that he had turned his uh, AVL off after every shift, but they still let the narrative get out there that he targeted JL and that he pulled up and that he saw that this was a single female driving on her own, which the facts don't support any of that from her tinted windows to the street not being lit up um, to the fact that it just wouldn't have been protocol to pull up next to her. He would have stayed behind her for officer safety. So none of that made sense. And this is one of literally hundreds of examples where the prosecution knew what the truth was and they simply didn't care. Wow. Is there any other information that you, you feel that we should know about the AVL or any other pieces yeah. Um, yeah. of your investigation? You know, like I said, AVL took a lot of importance, not only to the prosecution, but also to the public. And I don't really understand why. When, when you ask people, why is that? Why do you think Daniel's guilty? They'll say, yeah, AVL. They had him at all these locations. Daniel never denied having contact with a single one of these accusers. He didn't. And they didn't need AVL to prove 99% of them. In almost every case, he called that accuser in through his radio. That's how they got their name, so they could go ask the women if they were a victim of Daniel Holt's claw. All the AVL proves is that a vehicle is at a specific location at a specific time. If you or I are pulled over tonight after sundown, nine o'clock tonight, if we're pulled over going home tonight and an officer is going to write you a ticket, AVL would substantiate your claim that you were pulled over by an officer at that location. It would substantiate the officer saying he stopped someone at that location. But if you want to say that officer did something inappropriate, how is GPS going to prove or disprove that something happened? 
For some reason, the public believes AVL does that, and it doesn't. They didn't even need it in most of the cases. But something sure. people also need to know about AVL, I personally don't think it should be used or it should at least be highly scrutinized when used in court because testimony by the prosecutors themselves disclosed some very, very sort of eye-opening things about AVL. One, they said it can be off by as much as 1,200 feet. That is three and a half football fields that they said under oath it can be off. They also said, and use this term, it can be glitchy. That means it just doesn't always work like it's supposed to. The other problem they said that became evident is they said every single time you run an officer's AVL history, the numbers you get are different. Well, as, a, as someone on the defense team, we don't get to run his AVL. We have to deal with whatever the prosecution gives us. So they sit there and run that AVL over and over and over again until they get the most damning numbers from that AVL. Even though they may know 10 other times they ran it, it didn't look nearly as bad for Daniel. But on this 10th time or this 20th time it did, and then that's what they go forward with at court. Um, and it's something that is very unfair. It's unfair to defendants. Me as, a, as, as someone on the defense team, I don't have, I can't go to the police station and say, let me run Daniel's AVL and let's see what the numbers say after we run it 50 times. But here's something that's very important about the AVL. What it absolutely does prove is every single time one of these accusers lied and they lied over and over again. And we're not talking, there were some little bitty lies. They, they said I was pulled over on this street. The AVL says it was two or three streets, streets over. We're talking huge lies and we can get into those on individual accusers, but that's something that for whatever reason, the public didn't cling to, but it absolutely proves that a handful of these women uh, unequivocally were lying. Well, can you just explain to us like TM? How did, how did this ABL show that she lied? TM is, is very interesting. There's a couple of things in there with, with her statements. One, most of her interviews were recorded, but there are huge gaps. When officers literally checked her out of jail, a little field trip, and put her in the patrol car and said, we want you to go back and, and show us the route that, that Daniel took you on. They didn't record any of that conversation. The evidence shows that they were with her for well over an hour. They recorded none of those conversations that were happening. But at the end of that, they came out and said, oh, she described a very detailed zigzag route that his AVL perfectly followed. Well, that's, none of that is true. In none of the recordings um, does she ever talk about this zigzag route. When you look at the AVL, there is no zigzag route. Um, what's really important about it is that she claims that um, at the end of her encounter with Holtzclaw, that when he dropped her off, uh, that he dropped her off at this person she was referring to as her uncle, um, which even the prosecution agreed it wasn't her uncle, it's her drug dealer, and that she, she was dropped off in front of his condominium on the south side. The AVL shows that that never happened, never drove down the street that that man lives on. He never drove uh, slower than about 15 miles per hour in that general area. And when Detective Gregory was specifically asked about that, he admitted under oath he knew Terry Morris was lying about that specific detail. But for whatever reason, that didn't bother him. I have a question, if that's okay with, with everybody. Um, no. Just in terms of AVLs and when it comes to general traffic stops, um, Brian, I don't know if this is a question for you or Jenny, if this is a question for you and your research, but when it comes to a typical traffic stop, how long does an officer stay at that location for? And the part two of it is when it comes to Daniel's AVLs for all of these accusers, was that time consistent with a generic traffic stop or, you know, was, was he there for four minutes? Was he there for 40 minutes? And I know we'll get into each one, but in terms of generalities with the AVL and the GPS system, what are we looking at? Um, well, I, I can start with this. One, there, there is not going to be any general rule. And this was testified to at trial. It, that's officer discretion. Like so many things that patrol officers do, they have a, a wide latitude of discretion. With Daniel, most of his stops were really about 5, 10, maybe 15 minutes. And when you look at things like they really made a big deal about how long he was with accuser JL. Well, if you look at the surveillance video from that stop and their surveillance video that people think has no evidentiary value, it has a lot of evidentiary value. I personally think that as technology gets better, that specific video is actually going to clear Daniel at one point when they're able to show 
what he was doing at the patrol car with the accuser JL. But what we do know now is we know how much time he actually spent at her car as opposed to at his patrol car with JL. And it was only a couple of minutes that he spent with JL. He spent most of that time inside of her vehicle going through it. Um, the other things that, that, that we deal with on that is if an officer stops somebody, but it's a Friday night and there's a lot of uh, radio traffic, a lot of officers are stopping people, that officer may have to stay with that individual for 10 or 15 minutes until he gets an answer back because him running somebody for wants or warrants is a low priority compared to officers that are out on the scene on say an armed robbery going on or, or something like that. So all of those things can affect how long a, 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 a stop's gonna last. And in some instances, Daniel wasn't big on taking people to jail. Um, I commend him for that. Um, as it was testified to in, in court, many of the people that you pulled over in his area that he patrolled, they had warrants that were that were minor warrants. Um, they could have major, but a lot of them had minor warrants. They didn't have driver's licenses. They didn't have uh, insurance. And even as the prosecution uh, agreed and, and testified to, that was officer discretion. They don't have to arrest people. He didn't have to arrest Janie Liggins because she had a, a license that was 30 years expired and Janie's history of being pulled over shows that other officers pulled her over and did not arrest her for the exact same offense. They let her go. So I have a question, Mr. Bates. I, I'm listening to you and I, I'm thinking what would it have been like if I would have been sitting on this jury? So what do you think happened with this jury? How did that prosecution win them over with this ABL? Because when I'm listening to you, it's hard for me to, to, to connect that, the, you know, that this would lead to a conviction. So how did this, how did the prosecutors get this through to the jury? And the defense missed this somehow? I think that you have a public and a jury that wants the simplest conclusion. And they put an awful lot of stock in the opinions of prosecutors and officers who are allowed to show up and testify wearing their badge and their gun and looking all official. Um, and so they believe these things. And they hear things like AVL and they hear the woman say, well, I was stopped at this point and the AVL proves it. And they think that's evidence of a crime. It's not, it's evidence of a traffic stop. That's all that it's evidence of. Um, and every time that the, that the AVL didn't match what the female said, the prosecution would literally say, oh, she's just mistaken, as if it's okay if she's mistaken about some very important details, but she, but the, the, everything else she said has to be dead on. And so I think that, that, the, that the jury and the public was just fed these lies. They were willing to, to, to believe these lies. And then they also used the power of numbers. I mean, this was piling on. They knew that just JL's allegations alone would not get a conviction. They certainly knew TM's allegations would not get a conviction. They knew they were doing dealing with people who don't have credibility. And then they actually spun that to their own benefit to say, oh, look at look at the defense. Look at Daniel. He, he's intentionally going after people who aren't credible because nobody will believe them. That narrative is not true. Did the police believe JL when she made her complaint? Absolutely, they believed JL. There were over 100 officers involved in the initial days of her complaint. TM, Rocky Gregory spent weeks trying to locate TM. He absolutely took her allegations seriously. So to say that he targeted women that, that wouldn't be taken seriously, the facts don't back that up. Um, the, the public was just too eager to believe this story. It's sensationalized. You have this bad cop out there doing some really bad things if you want to believe the prosecution. And then you have 13 accusers and people say, well, the odds are in my favor. So I'm going to go with, with camp prosecution. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, if there's no other questions at this time, I'm going to move on to the DNA portion. Um, Erica, if you could share with us how you got involved in this case, I would really appreciate that. Yes, I was minding my own business back in 2016, working in a lab with DNA here at Iowa State University. And I happened to see an article on January 21st, 2016. That was the day I saw an officer was sentenced to 263 years. And I noticed that the case involved DNA. So that interested me. Also, I have in my background, like you, I've worked and volunteered as a victim's advocate at a domestic violence shelter and on a SART team. So I was interested in the sexual assault aspect of it. That led me to question why it was that the prosecution was so convinced that they had found a guilty officer based on just 
what appeared in the article to be a small quantity of DNA on the fly of Daniel's pants. And this is a picture here of Daniel, the day JL accused him, and actually KL accused him right before early in the morning, and then AG, the teenager, accused him the night before. So that is when he was brought in to have his interrogation, and they photographed him then. And you can correct so me if I'm wrong, how, Brian. How did you, Erica, before we jump into this, how did you get involved in the case? Yes. So you heard about I, it. You, you I heard, heard about it. Yeah, I got right. it. Yeah. So how did right, you? Right, right. And I thought, well, there are other explanations besides sexual assault for DNA found on the fly of the pants. I actually would Google search Daniel Holtzclaw innocent for the next couple of days, thinking, is there any more to the story? And I happened to read Brian Bates's article early in 2016 that talked about a lot of errors in the investigation that made me curious to learn more about the DNA issues. One of the articles mentioned there was more than one person's DNA. I contacted the family and over time, over the next several months, was able to look at the DNA documents. Right away, when I looked at them, I saw there were four swabs taken from the fly of Daniel's pants and the two outer ones from the outside of the fly on either side, there was male DNA in there. And eventually, when I was able to get the DNA documents from Elaine Taylor, who was the OCPD analyst, about the inside of the fly of the pants that she swabbed, I realized she had actually found male DNA there too. But no one, any time that I had heard of in the press, had mentioned there was unknown male DNA on the fly of the pants. And the reason that was significant is that a male would not make vaginal fluid. And so there had to be some explanation for that individual's DNA on the fly of the pants that didn't involve his vaginal fluid. Therefore, it was wrong for the prosecutors to think that finding female DNA could only be best explained by vaginal fluid. When you had this male DNA, there's that exculpatory element to it that I had never heard about. I called the Holtz clause, I remember I called them and asked, were you aware that there was male DNA on the fly of Daniel's pants? And they didn't remember it at all. They had never heard of that. And I think actually they had communicated with you then too, Brian, and you looked and you did not realize that there was male DNA either. Is that correct from your memory of how it happened? Right. That was, we went back yeah. through and looked at the transcripts and, and found that that was something where the DNA expert that had been hired um, was extremely neglectful and um, never pointed out that, that DNA, that male DNA was existent anywhere during the testing. Yes. Yes. And so that just started me looking more carefully at Elaine Taylor's testimony, and I realized there were quite a few errors, which I can get into. This slide here actually shows where she swabbed the outside of the fly of the pants after she got them the day after JL's allegation. She did not see any evidence of body fluid. There were no stains or deposits. She used a bright light with magnifying glass. She So the importance of that is you would expect to find vaginal fluids or saliva or some kind of body fluids if there had been a sexual assault. And she didn't see anything visibly. She also didn't use an alternate light source, which is a light that would cause body fluids or other fluids to fluoresce. So if there were invisible tiny quantities of body fluid, you could detect them using this alternate light source. She never did that. The main point was just visibly, there's nothing on the dark blue pants that would have suggested vaginal fluid so, uh, or, or, or saliva. It's a concern then that the police department so quickly assumed sexual assault must be the only explanation for the DNA. Kelly, I saw that you jumped on. I do, I have a question. This is just me, my, my personal question. Um, we talked about this a little bit last week of when these pants were taken into evidence, um, which I think is super important because if I just sexually assaulted somebody or raped somebody, I'm probably getting rid of any evidence possible, right? I'm not about to wear the same pants to work, let alone to uh, to an interview, shall we say. So Erica, can you just go into a little bit about when these pants were taken in, when they were allegedly from? Yes, so these pants were allegedly the same pants that Daniel had worn the night of June 17th, 2014. That was when he stopped the teenager AG that the police didn't know it at that time. And then the next morning, the morning of, June 18th, 2014. Eventually the police figured out he stopped a woman, J KL. And then at 2 a.m. he stopped JL. She 
went for a SANE exam at about 4 a.m. on that morning, which you've talked about in your previous session, you talked about how it gave negative results, no DNA from Daniel in her mouth or around her mouth, just her own DNA. And around four in the afternoon on June 18th, 2014 is when Daniel was interrogated. The next slide, I believe, or maybe we already had it earlier, <laughs> the one before shows where Detective Rocky Gregory it was four days. In bag. It was four days. Say it again. Four it days. It was four. It was four days. Well, the same day. No, no. The same it's day. The same day. Okay. So June eighteenth, twenty fourteen, is when JL made her allegation. Right. And that afternoon, Daniel was interrogated. In his but after his shift, shelf. after he had already gone home, yes, changed clothes, didn't yes, launder then- his clothes. He said that his underwear he'd put in the wash, in the washer. That's what he told detectives. And then he had the same pants on, he said. And they believed him. And then the fact that they found DNA that ultimately matched one of the accusers, I think made them feel that he had not laundered them. This is the actual evidence that was left over from the the previous shift. And and I ask the dumbest probably question ever, which I know has probably been asked many times, but could the, could the DNA have been planted? I, I mean, um, I, I mean, I know yeah. the, the theories for, for the women's DNA and the man's DNA from traffic stops, you go to the bathroom, it's touch DNA, it's transfer DNA, but um, our, our, our members are very much into DNA. So. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. At least not with the first two samples, which were from the outside of the, fly a flap when you unzip it, because at that point, the detectives hadn't had contact with AG, the teenager. Now, when Rocky Gregory, what he did is he put his bare hand in the evidence bag before Daniel put his pants and bag in it. So you could find DNA from Rocky Gregory that transferred to the bag and then to pants or previously from pens that they gave Daniel during their interrogation. But I haven't seen a route by which AG's DNA could have been planted to give her DNA on the outside of the fly. But the strange thing about the evidence, and this only was noticed after the trial, is that the chain of custody shows that after the pants were swabbed on the outer surfaces by Elaine Taylor, they were in the OCPD DNA lab. She kept them in the lab until April of 2015. So that's many months later. And at that point, the chain of custody shows the pants were given to some unnamed person in the sex crimes division. That's the detective's sex crimes division. You're supposed to have the person who receives the pants sign for them in the chain of custody. That did not happen. So then the pants in 2015 before the trial were in the sex crimes unit for about five months. And we learned from the teenager AG, she had a deposition she talks about, which was not known at the trial, that the detectives brought her in repeatedly to talk about the allegation. And I'm not sure the time period of that, but they brought her in. So, and also by that point, they had her DNA. So theoretically, it's possible that if somebody wanted to plant DNA on the inside of the fly of the pants, where, where they ultimately found a tiny quantity of DNA matching her as well as other unknown people's DNA, theoretically possible they could have used her purified DNA. But I'm guessing that the inside of the fly of the pants, it looks to me like just a a smaller quantity of DNA, similar to what was found on the outer surfaces. There's a little more DNA. And you had actually asked a question, I think, about DNA quantities in the previous session. So I wanted to let you know the DNA quantity, because if you found a lot, a huge quantity of DNA, that would be more suggestive of body fluid. But and this, this isn't going to be in the slide, but the, there were four stretches of fabric that were swabbed, and the quantity of DNA in those four ranged from 40 nanograms of DNA on the outside of fly. And then when you unzip it, there's a stretch of fabric, and that exterior side of that fabric had 23 nanograms of DNA, and it ranged down to the inside of the fly where you had 11 nanograms and 20 to 3 nanograms. And keep in mind, this is DNA from at least three people. So it's not as if all the DNA comes from just one person. That if it had all come from cells, if it were purified DNA that was contaminated, it wouldn't come from cells. But if it had come from cells, that would equate to about 6,700 cells, skin cells or epithelial cells on the outside, if there were cells, down to 1,900 on the inside. 
one point I should make is no one ever looked for cells. You hear people talking about how there were skin cells, there were epithelial cells. No one ever looked for cells. They just purified DNA from swabbing. So it's not scientifically appropriate to say there were cells there. If I took a, some purified DNA from me and put it somewhere, there wouldn't be cells. It would just be DNA. But the assumption is there would be some cells there or sweat that carry the DNA. For the DNA quantity, for comparison, to give you a way to gauge how much DNA that is, when they swabbed his patrol car, they swabbed a handle on the back where JL had been sitting, the handle of the door, and they swabbed the little handle there. And they actually found about 50 nanograms or slightly more DNA there. And it was all from one unknown male. So presumably that's just touch DNA left on the handle. And that was more DNA than was found in any one of the swabs from fly the pants. So, so I hope that answered your question about taint. Okay. I don't know. If, I don't think there was any contamination, but you don't know. And it was never raised at trial that there could have been contamination of the pants. It could explain the DNA, some of the DNA, at least on the inside of the fly. So can you explain, Kelly actually brought this up. Um, she actually said, gave us a few examples, but can you give us a little more detail about what would be some non-sexual explanations of how the DNA got on his pants? Yes. So the main explanation we think is the explanation for what happened because there's a small quantity of DNA, no evidence of body fluid, is probably it resulted from pat searches because police officers, actually, if you go to the previous slide, there's a picture of um, Tulsa police officer, Jason Angel, showing how he would do a backhand pat search with me. And what the officer does is have the individual put her hands behind her back, interlacing the fingers, and then he actually puts his hands over her hands. And that's just the perfect way to get DNA from a person onto your hands. And then when you touch something here, go to the restroom, you could transfer that person's DNA to the fly of her pants, for example. And, and I would love to see a study of the pants that men wear and the flies, because my guess is you would find a lot of DNA for many people on there. And you it, it would be ridiculous to assume that every man is out there sexually assaulting someone. You can't just assume that based on finding a small quantity of DNA in the fly of the pants that there was a sexual assault. The next slide then actually shows Daniel in his deposition in 2019 when he was demonstrating how he did the pat search. And so on the left, you can see him showing how the person interlaces the fingers and then he holds their hands with one hand and uses the back of his hand to swipe the waist on one side and then uses his other hand and swipes with his other hand. And he was showing that on his hand, you would expect to find people's DNA the reason pat searching like this is a possibility and a good explanation for the DNA evidence is that when he stopped AG, so this was the night before JL, eventually when she was found to match the main female profile on the fly of the pants. And she's the teenager, correct? She's the teenager, yes. They found that um, she was actually with a female and a male at the time Daniel first stopped her their nicknames are face and chocolate. And so there were three people there in her deposition. She says that he, pat, he searched all three of them during the trial. She said that he just searched her purse, but even searching someone's purse, you could transfer DNA from the purse to your hands. And then if you use the restroom to your pants, but if, if you look at the DNA results where you have male DNA, unknown male DNA and female DNA, female DNA, you know there's at least three people that could match exactly what happened with Daniel Pat searching a male and two females. And then that DNA got transferred to the fly of his pants sometime during that night when he used the restroom. So that's one possible scenario. And the, the troubling part is there was actually, there were actually quite a few articles available at the time in 2018, even before that OCPD, the Oklahoma City Police Department could have learned about to lead them to conclude, ah, finding DNA on a man's pants, on our officer's pants does not mean he's guilty. There's an article from 2010, so that's five years before Daniel's trial, four years before the investigation, by Sarah Jones and Kirsty Scott. And they discovered that when a man would touch a woman's face and hands briefly, he could then transfer her DNA when he unzipped his pants and simulated urinating, he was able to transfer her DNA, not just to his underpants, but actually to his genitals. 
So finding a woman's DNA on your genitals does not mean you sexually assaulted someone. You could have just shaken someone's hand. And that was already known in a, it was a small report in 2010. But then other evidence came out through articles that should have made the Oklahoma City Police Department conclude that finding DNA on the fly of Daniel's pants does not mean he's guilty. One was an article that was published October 27th, 2015. That was right before Daniel's trial. Helmus et al. So and others. And they found that you could actually have tertiary transfer of a person's skin cell DNA. So if you had a person hold a piece of cloth, give the cloth to someone else, and then that other person would uh, touch a second piece of cloth, you could actually find the per first person's DNA on the second piece of cloth. So it could go from one object to another to another, and you could still find a full DNA profile on this second piece of cloth that the person never even touched. And that would mirror very similarly what happened perhaps in Daniel's case, if all he did had been just search through AG's purse, the teenager's purse, even without pad searching her, he could have gotten her DNA from the purse to his hands, to the fly of the pants. That would have been from her hands to the purse, to his hands, to the fly, and you find a full DNA profile. So it does not mean a sexual assault happened. You can't actually have indirect transfer of DNA like that. That's the, I think the best explanation for the DNA evidence because you have a small quantity, you have a mixture of DNA from multiple people. It's not just one profile. It's not just female DNA from one person. And then there's no evidence of any body fluid. Visibly, you can't see anything. And you would expect to find some staining or deposits because uh, another article that came out actually in 2016 found that if a man has sexual intercourse with a woman for two minutes without ejaculation, and then he pulls on his underpants, you see visible staining on the underpants. Daniel was accused, this is an important part, he was accused, at least by the time of the trial, everyone was then accusing him, if they did accuse him of rape or oral sodomy, of having his gun belt on and unzipping his pants and then pulling out his penis. So they would have had to, if there was contact, it would have been directly contact with the fly of his pants. He would have had to have body fluid or something that would transfer. So the fact that there was nothing really should have been alerting the detectives that I don't, I don't think we're correct in just assuming he was guilty. So I'm going to back up for a second. So when JL, you know, she, we talked about this last week when she reported that this had happened to that police officer in the convenience store, wherever, and then they take her to the hospital. They, did they swab her mouth? Yeah, they did. So part of the same kit was they did an oral wash. So they got liquid from inside her mouth and then they also swabbed around her mouth. And the forensic analyst, Elaine Taylor, in the test, in the trial, and this shows her bias, she said that, quote, unfortunately, they did not find any DNA from Daniel in, in, her, in JL's mouth. They just found DNA from JL. So that showed she already believed or thought he was guilty. And maybe that partly explains why she ended up testifying in ways that were incorrect and led the jurors to think that vaginal fluid was the best explanation for the female DNA. Well, but wasn't he convicted of, and Brian, you can chime in on here because I'm, I'm just a little confused. So yeah. it's convicted in the JL case of the oral sodomy, correct? Yes. Yeah. How, how could he be convicted if there was no evidence in the oral cavity? I am just yeah. confused well, with that. The, I think the detectives probably explained it away saying by, oh, he would she would swallow the DNA. You're not necessarily going to find his DNA, but it should have been something that would make people think there's reasonable doubt that he did it. And that's the whole point in the trial is, is there reasonable doubt? And so it is, it is a good question of how, why didn't the jurors consider that lack of evidence? Yeah. Cause I would like to know how long DNA would remain in the mouth. Maybe she went home, she brushed her teeth. Maybe she, she used a, a mouthwash. Maybe, you know, if, if that happens to a victim, they're going to probably, unless they go straight to the hospital, they're probably going to, we know we tell victims now don't take a bath, whatever, Right. but maybe she went home and she brushed her teeth. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't but know. How long yeah. would that, that, that um, DNA stay in her mouth, even if she had brushed her teeth or, or would it be just washed away? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I would have to look up the actual data on that, but my memory is that it could stay. Right? Yeah, it is that it could stay up to a day or more. Like they say, if, um, even if a, a suspect and they didn't swab Daniel's genitals, but even if a suspect was taking a shower, they're still supposed to swab just to make sure. Yeah. So that's a good question. I don't know the answer about how long you would expect DNA. It's probably varies is my guess. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really an important question to, to really look into because I would think, and I've, I've worked with sexual assault victims before, and um, I know that, you know, we ask them not to take a bath and, and sometimes they do because they, they need to, they feel like they need to. Um, but in this case, you know, with the timeline, I'm just really, I'm, I'm baffled that, she gets to the hospital and there's mm -hmm. no DNA in the oral cavity. That, yeah. That's, that's, it's mind boggling. So um, did somebody else have a question? Well, I, I was going to say she, oh, JL gave several different times. She gave accounts of what happened that evening and, and they changed a little bit, but in none of those accounts that they include going home and brushing her teeth and doing any of those sorts of things. And, and since this case, I've dealt with other sexual assault cases and we've had experts that were sane nurses and such. And, and they've said that standard protocol would have been to ask before doing that test, whether or not they introduced any other, whether or not they brushed their teeth yeah. or they used mouthwash or anything like that. So that should have been a standard question. And my belief would be is if she said that she had done those things, they would have made sure to note it because that would then explain why there wasn't any, any DNA in her oral cavity. And something else I think that's important that the, that the defense did bring up during this part of it, and Erica can maybe expound if it really is important or not, but I thought it was important that they limited their swabbing simply to the fly of the pants, the most damning area where the defense said, did you check the inside of the pockets? Did you check the knees? Did you check the back pockets? And the prosecution seemed dumbfounded. Why would we do that? Well, because if you did find JL's uh, or you found AG's uh, DNA inside the pockets, on the back of the pants, that would prove that the D her DNA was actually on Daniel's hands and that he was simply, as he put his hands in his pockets or he touched the back of his pants or he touched his knees, he was transferring DNA all over the place. Instead, they only looked in the most damning area and, and sure enough found it. My guess would have been, had they checked things like the inside of the pockets, they would have found it there too. Well, and yeah. Brian, wouldn't it also be on handcuffs, the pen, a notebook? his car anywhere. door handle, anything like that? Anywhere, and, and here's what baffles me. They didn't want to find it anywhere else. I mean, you have investigators who over and over and over again say that Daniel Holtzclaw is a, is, a, is a consistent liar, yet they believe him when it's convenient to believe him. Oh, your underwear that you were supposedly wearing during three rapes that all happened in, in one shift you put those in the washer, okay, we're not going to go to your house and look for those. You say these are the same pants that you had on for both shifts. We're going to believe you because you're such an upstanding citizen. We're going to believe you then. Everything else, though, yeah, we're not going to believe any of that. They never went to his house and served a search warrant. They wanted nothing. They didn't want his cell phone. They didn't want, he had four, at least four other pairs of uniform at home. They didn't want any of those things. They didn't want to make sure that maybe the underwear's in the dirty clothes or in the washer, but the washer hadn't been turned on. They didn't care. They had what they needed. They wanted to stop because if you continue to look, you may find what's called exculpatory evidence, and then you've got to acknowledge it. They didn't want to have to acknowledge it. So Brian, could, could somebody get those pants today and test the pockets? At, th at this point, they're not turning them over as far as I know. But yes, it, it, is it theoretically possible that the pants could be tested in the pockets and knees and all these places? Theoretically, yes. Legally, how do you obtain those pants for that? That's, that's a question for, yeah. for somebody who's got a little bit more knowledge. Yeah. And we'll talk about that later, the status of Daniel's case and the efforts to get his pants for more testing, because that is one of the goals to try to do the steps that the Oklahoma City Police Department did not do. And one of those, like you've talked about now in the previous session, was they did not go to the house to get the underpants. And I did look at the trial transcript, and that was raised by Daniel's trial attorney that the detectives failed to get the underpants from the house when they should have done that because it could have provided other data. For example, if the stain kit ends up negative, if you were to find saliva and jails, DNA on the underpants that would be very convincing evidence of guilt, but they, they didn't have that. So then all they had were the pants. And when, when here we see 
Ms. Taylor, the OCPD lab DNA analyst, when she got the pants, it turns out her deposition showed that she wasn't even thinking of body fluid. When she swabbed the fly of the pants on the outside, in her mind, what she thought was maybe JL had put her hands on Daniel's fly as he was allegedly orally sodomizing her. And so Ms. Taylor was looking for touch DNA from JL's hands. She didn't even test for saliva. She wasn't even thinking of saliva at the time, she now says. So it's so hypocritical for the prosecution in the trial, we'll see, and I'll talk about it here a little bit, to claim that the DNA from AG was most likely caused by vaginal fluid transfer when that DNA was obtained by the analyst when she wasn't even looking for body fluids and she thought it was touch DNA to begin with. She, she thought it was non-sexual DNA. So- well, and I think it's also oh, funny that Miss Taylor, it looks to now be sponsored by Starbucks during the trial. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, oh right. Oh, that was actually the deposition. That it was, was a joke, but yeah, sponsored by Starbucks. <laughs> um, I, there's a question from Jennifer M. Um, did the defense ask to get the DNA on the pants thrown out from being admitted as evidence since the detective obviously contaminated it since we saw in the previous pictures where he was handling it without any gloves? So my understanding is the defense DNA expert, Dr. Brant Cassidy, did not realize or see that video. He didn't realize the contamination. I don't think, Brian, you or Mr. Adams had realized it at the time either, but maybe you can talk about it. My, my memory was that no one ever asked for the DNA evidence to be thrown out. The thought was to try to undermine it at trial, but unfortunately, Mr. Adams did not have all the information he could benefit from to challenge the evidence and the false claims that I'll talk about Ms. Taylor making, but Brian, you can tell me what you know, because obviously you know more about what happened at that point. Right. Well, you know, like a lot of people who, who follow crime cases and trials, the attorneys, they focus in on the law. People like myself, the investigators, we look at and try to find flaws in the investigation that were done. And then we rely on third parties, which would be experts. Um, unfortunately, we, we didn't know of, uh, of Ms. Fuse at that time. Um, and we hired a, an expert that, in my opinion, um, should not put himself out as an expert uh, because we heavily relied on his, uh, his opinions. And his opinions um, you know, didn't, didn't reveal um, what now we know were so many missteps by the prosecution. So if that wasn't conveyed to us, then we wouldn't have argued it because we rely on, a, on an expert who was paid thousands of dollars um, mm -hmm. to look at something and tell us these are the flaws, just like I'm paid to look at the flaws of the investigation. He's paid to look at the flaws in the DNA analysis. And um, I mean, the list of things that he didn't point out is pretty endless. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't point out anything about the male DNA and he didn't tell anything about the DNA quantity. So when Mr. Adams, Daniel's defense attorney, questioned Ms. Taylor about the DNA quantity. She actually said, I can tell you a DNA quantity, but then he didn't pursue to get her to actually reveal how small the quantity of DNA was. That was another thing. And then there were some other issues that Mr. Adams didn't know to challenge. So this slide will show some of the errors that Ms. Taylor made. The first thing, she claimed that there was no evidence of male DNA on the inside of the fly. And I showed in those previous slides how you could actually see the Y, which stands for Y chromosome for male, that it was found in all four DNA samples from the fly of the pants. She said, there's no Y, so the answer is no. And that was based on testimony about the inside of the fly of the pants. And by itself, that's not important, but the, the prosecution used this claim to build a whole argument that Daniel didn't simply touch something that Ms. H.G. had touched and then touched the fly of his pants. The oh, prosecution, mm -hmm. go ahead. I'm sorry, I do have a question just to, uh, yeah. for time's sake. Um, Brian, you or Erica, or both of you can answer this. So uh, Brian, earlier you, you made the comment that there were a lot of accusers, a lot. Um, I, I didn't realize there were more than 13. Um, so there were many accusers out there, yet he was convicted of eight of the accusers' allegations. What set those apart from the other ones where they, there was no conviction? Well, I, I actually think the prosecution said it best when they asked um, Detective Rocker Gregory about this, and he admitted that the jury simply, his quote was, split the baby. 
um, that the jury didn't know. And, and I see this a lot. A jury doesn't know exactly what someone's guilty or innocent of, so they just split it right down the middle. I don't think it's by accident that they split the number of, of guilties and innocents right down the middle. I mean, that's what they did. It was half guilty, half innocent. Um, and it's very telling that they did not take their job as a jury seriously um, because one, they they gave him the most years. I believe it was 62 years on accuser S.E., who accuser S.E. said that her attacker was a short, dark-skinned black male. The most number of years was given on that testimony. Not only did she say it was a short, black-skinned, dark male, but she gave a location that the AVL proves is absolutely impossible for him to have taken her to that location, and he got 62 years alone just on that one. Um, then the other thing, which goes back to the DNA, and, and I think we're going to get into our, our comments that that prosecutor Galen Gigger made in his closing argument. And the problem is that the jury didn't pay attention to their instructions. Their instructions are very, very clear. Nothing, nothing that any of the lawyers on either side say is evidence. Nothing. Yet they relied very, very much on just a couple of lines that Galen Gigger said in his closing argument, even though the judge told them specifically, anything these lawyers say is not evidence, and they totally disregarded that. And then later in televised interviews said they relied on those comments by Mr. Gigger to make themselves feel confident in their guilty verdicts. Mm -hmm. And the guilty verdicts that they gave based on this closing argument statement, which was actually several slides back by Gigger, it's Yes, he said that the most important thing about AG is the fact that DNA from the walls of her vagina transferred in vaginal fluids. And then there's one of the jurors who said that because of that testimony, other jurors who were willing at that point to acquit Daniel because they didn't believe many of the accusers, because of that DNA evidence and this belief that it was from vaginal fluid, that made them really think then to convict him, not just of AG's allegations, but also other women's allegations. So how, how do we know that, Erica? Did somebody, did, did either you or Brian or somebody else speak with the, the jurors? It was uh, actually just an interview. And the jurors have not talked and willing to talk it with the defense team, but a juror talked with the media and he said, and this is actually, and it was on Crime Watch. He said, well, I'm not a DNA expert. They told us it was DNA from the vaginal fluid from a 17 year old. And then the DNA people are pretty boring to be honest with you. Then in another quote, in another interview, he was reported as having said that there were some jurors who due to the fact of who the victims were, had a hard time believing them. And it was the DNA evidence on the inside of Holtz Claw's pants and the testimony involving the 17 year old that helped get deliberations moving. So that led jurors to be willing to convict Daniel because there was this DNA. And back to that slide of Elaine Taylor, the, the false information she gave that would have been confusing the jury is not only she said there was no DNA there from males, she also concluded it was not Daniel's DNA. And this is extremely bad as a forensic analyst because the DNA data were actually inconclusive. We don't know whether it's some of Daniel's DNA is there or not. It could be some of his DNA exactly like you would expect if he's touching the fly of his pants. But she was dead set in believing his DNA is not there, even though it contradicted her own data. And then the prosecution, and she used that to argue that, well, if his DNA couldn't even transfer from his hands, how could you ever explain non-intimate DNA from AG transferring on his hands to the fly of his pants if his own DNA couldn't transfer? The prosecutor argued then repeatedly, well, if you didn't find his DNA from touching the fly of his pants when he used the restroom, basically, wouldn't that mean it's more likely to be from vaginal fluid? And Elaine Taylor testified, it's a very good explanation. Yeah, a very good possibility is what she said, that vaginal fluid transferred the DNA. That she also testified outside her expertise. She said a young woman of her age, the AG's age, would be very likely to have quite a bit of lubrication. That's outside of the expertise of a DNA expert. And she claimed there was no presumptive test for vaginal fluid. So that made it look more reasonable that she didn't even do a presumptive test when there actually are, there is a presumptive test for vaginal fluid. That's where you can detect what you think is vaginal fluid. Other fluids could give a positive result, but it's very likely to be vaginal fluid. So she led the jurors to believe she tested everything as much as she could and that vaginal fluid was the best explanation. So then that's how, based on those claims she made, all of which were false, the prosecutor then 
amplified it in his closing argument with that statement, which we saw in a following slide where he told the jury that it was a fact that the DNA transferred in vaginal fluid from AG. And then after that, oh, what's interesting is actually during the trial, so the closing argument isn't supposed to be evidence. And during the trial though, Geeger admitted he knew that the DNA, you couldn't say it's from vaginal fluid because he said, Ms. Taylor, you can't say how the DNA got there, can you, from a scientific standpoint? And she said, no, she could only tell that it's some biological material from Ms. AG. So Geeger knew you could not say this is vaginal fluid. But then if you go to the other slides, you'll see what he did. He not only misled the jurors, but on the next slide, you find out from Ms. AG's deposition that she gave after the trial in the civil lawsuits against Daniel, she said that before she testified when she was in the witness room, prosecutor came to her and said that the reason he believed her was that her vaginal fluid had been found on the fly of the police officer's pants. And he encouraged her to testify because she was the one where the one accuser where they did have some evidence that connected her to Daniel. The reason this is especially troubling is you shouldn't have a prosecutor lying to someone. It's a lie to say there's vaginal fluid. You don't even test for it. It's just unscientific. You can't say you find something when you don't test for it. And you shouldn't do it to a witness. She's 18 years old at this point. But it came out in the police reports. And this was never really emphasized. But it's troubling to me because I've seen cases where you have people who are wrestling with mental health issues that she was wrestling she has the challenge of bipolar disorder and using antipsychotic medication. And so to have a prosecutor tell someone, anyone who is testifying to something false is bad, but especially when you are telling there's someone with mental illness who may not be in touch with reality, that to me is really unethical. And yeah, one thing we haven't got- She's vulnerable, she's vulnerable. Yeah, and we haven't gotten into it, her allegation, and hopefully we can get into it later, sure. what her mom said that, oh, she said it was just a hot cop and they showed her a picture mother showed her a picture of Daniel. So she's really steered toward making an allegation against him. So you mentioned- so oh, Kelly, Kelly jumped on real quick. Yeah. Oh, no, I just have a quick question. Um, just back to, to DNA differentiations, right? You were talking about, Erica, such a minute amount of DNA that's been found um, on Daniel's pants. How do you differentiate it being touch DNA, saliva DNA, and vaginal DNA. How can you tell the difference? You, the only thing you can give do me like is, a very short, short explanation of that. Oh well, typically, if you're going to conclude that the DNA came from a body fluid, you'd actually have to test for the body fluid. So you could do a test to see if there's saliva. Finding saliva doesn't it probably means the DNA came from it. So that would give you a good clue that probably this is saliva from the person. Or you could do the presumptive test, a test for vaginal fluid, and that would suggest it. You could actually see staining, that would be a clue. But if you find DNA where there's a low quantity and typically there's DNA from more people, it's a mixture because when you touch something like a doorknob, you could have a, more people's DNA or touch multiple people and then touch something, that's more likely to be touch DNA transfer. Just but but what, I'm saying, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that they're saying oral sodomy, right? So did they automatically test for saliva? No, in fact, the OCP. But you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm trying yeah. to figure out, like, what is the aha X or Y or Z or A or B factor that says this was vaginal fluid? Well, they should have done a test for it. They should have tested for saliva. The OCPD lab actually hadn't done that test for a long time. They sort of just didn't do it. They were just focusing on DNA. And they really ignored the possibility of non-intimate transfer. Even detectives didn't ever consider that there could be non-intimate transfer of DNA. And the OCPD lab, they, they weren't really doing tests for body fluids. Supposedly, Ms. Taylor said, that's kind of not what labs do now, but it's crucial because especially with the sensitivity of DNA where you can just have a few cells and you can get a full DNA profile now, you need to test for body fluids because people can be convicted based on finding a small quantity of DNA. And then you have the prosecution mushrooming it into something claiming that there's body fluids when there's no evidence for it. So you have to be able to say, I suspect that there's bodily fluids associated with this. Then I yeah. test for either saliva or vaginal or whatever yeah. bodily fluids you may have yeah. um, and go from there. Yeah, they should have just 
immediately. Or did this happen in this in this instance? No, all they did, all she did is she got the pants and she swabbed for DNA. She looked at them, took pictures, swabbed for DNA, put them in a clump so DNA could transfer all over from one part of the pants to the other, put them back in the bag. There was no testing or screening for body fluids at all. And that's that was one of the things that really concerned me when I first learned about the case. And I thought they didn't even look for body fluids. How can they ever make any argument claiming there's body fluids when they didn't even look for it? Uh, one thing though, I, I think I mentioned earlier, there's a DNA expert, Dr. Spence, who's, who is, has written a report for Daniel's defense team. And he talked about how, if you did find a large quantity of DNA, even without screening or finding body fluids, that could make you think that it could be body fluid there, even if you didn't get a definitive positive test for body fluid. But that's not what we have in Daniel's case, because it's just a very small quantity of DNA and then no obvious evidence of body fluids. So I, I have a question actually for Brian. Um, so we know that, and I heard Erica a few minutes ago talk about civil depositions. So how many of these accusers sued the Oklahoma City Police Department. Either Erica, do you or, or Brian know that answer? Yeah, I, I think any, closer than well, I did. currently there are 11 of the 13. So there's four of the women whose allegations led to acquittals they sued. And then the, it would be so seven the four, others. Four of the yeah. women who's who, who, where Daniel was, was acquitted, acquitted. They right. still, they sued. They sued and Did then they recover? Did they the win? remaining. Uh, right now, this is not decided. So the the so eleven women who sued. Right. Okay. Now it's against Daniel only. Originally they'd sued the city of Oklahoma City, claiming that the city did not investigate their allegations. And I would say the definitely the city investigated the allegations, but with a horribly biased investigation oh. with lots of errors. So the city's any no of unit. these lawsuits come to fruition? Like have any of them ended? Are they no. all in the middle still of, of litigation? They're all it's in the middle of federal courts. Yeah. Pardon me, Jenny? There was one that made an allegation that changed it completely and she didn't even make it to trial. Uh, Demi, uh, or DEC, I guess would be her initial. She, um, she they, the city did settle $25,000 uh, with her. Okay, yeah. and was she was one she of the acquittals or? No, she didn't even make it. She didn't even go oh, to trial. She didn't make it to trial, yeah. but the city went ahead and and settled with her mm -hmm. in a separate lawsuit. And Brian, you were the one who realized that she had made a use of force allegation against Daniel, and only after the the other accusers made sexual assault allegations did she then change this the person her, her, initial, Campbell, her claim. Her, her initial allegation was that uh, Daniel had stopped her because she matched the description of a woman that police were looking for for an incident that had occurred just before then, and that she claimed that Daniel was just too rough with her, that he just kind of roughed her up a little bit because I think she got a little sassy with him, didn't want to be stopped because she wasn't the suspect that they, they were looking for, but she matched the description, and Daniel wanted to detain her to make sure she wasn't the woman. She didn't want to be detained, so she went and made a complaint about that. Well, then you fast forward a little bit, and she finds that, whoa, that's the same officer who's accused of all these sexual assaults. So she went back and changed her very specific allegation and then added a sexual assault element to it. And they basically paid her enough to break even. Um, and that's kind of how they figured out what her costs were up to that point. That's what they paid her and said, go away. But they didn't give her allegations enough credibility to even result in any criminal charges because that specific allegation was investigated prior to JL ever coming forward and kicking this off. And they just found it was totally unsubstantiated. Okay. Well, thank you. So we are actually coming to a to the end of this this um, session today. But what what can we do? Is there anything we can do to try to get any of the forensic evidence so that Daniel can actually get a another trial? I think it would be very helpful if people were to contact OCPD and the city of Oklahoma City and encourage them to release the evidence, the pants, and also there was a report that Ms. Taylor's supervisor, Mr. Campbell Reddick, wrote about her testimony and, and presumably the errors in it because of Daniel filing his appeal. And that report is a written report by Campbell Reddick. The city is refusing to release it, claiming, oh, it's part of her personnel records. But we have strong evidence supporting that 
Mr. Reddick was critical of her testimony, probably similar to some of the criticisms I made. And that would be useful evidence to show that OCPD made errors. We so want the, to get the, that. So the viewers, the listeners, myself, and anybody else out there, um, what you're suggesting is that we reach out to the Oklahoma Police Department and say, release this evidence? I mean- Yeah, you, it's that basically that simple, saying we're concerned. Please release the evidence in Daniel Holtzclaw's case, please help because there are these errors that were very substantial forensic analysis errors leading to Daniel's conviction. That happened to him and they're not recognized by OCPD or corrected. This can be happening to other people as well. So it helps the department if they can acknowledge these errors and admit them and release the evidence to help. That's what we all want is the criminal justice system to work better. And without having valid forensic science done by a police department, everybody's at risk. Well, as a criminal justice, justice professor, I always say what we want is the truth, right? Right. That's what exactly. we want. We want the truth. And so I'm trying to figure out what the, you know, like if I call um, the chief of police and say, hey, I would like to get these, you know, these pants. I would like to get this testimony, get this personnel file. My guess is that the chief is probably going to say, you're not going to get it. So no. I'm, get, I'm trying to figure out other ways that we can do that. And I think, um, you know, the Crime HQ folks out there, they might have some ideas. Um, mm -hmm. And if anybody has any ideas, they should absolutely share it with, with any of us, because I think it's really important um, at the very least to get this information so that Daniel can actually get another trial, a fair trial. Uh, yes. I think that's really important. Um, so I think we're all, we're really out of time. I, does anybody yeah, else? Yeah, a couple more things if that's okay. Hey, Jenny, go ahead and um, stop your screen share if that's okay. Um, Brian, I have a question for you. Um, let's say DNA, or, and actually for both Brian and, and for Dr. Jackson, DNA is thrown out, right? Uh, the, the GPS on his vehicle thrown out or in, in doesn't count. Uh, what's left to convict Daniel? What is there left? Nothing. I, I honestly, I think if you took out the misrepresentations of the DNA alone, um, I think that would would probably have been enough because I I believe in our early reports we got is that the first polling of the jury is they were willing to acquit Daniel. Not that they were completely convinced that he was innocent, but they didn't think that he had been proven guilty and they were willing to acquit. And it was through the deliberation process and the misinterpretation of statements made by the DNA expert for the prosecution and by the, and by the prosecutor um, that they switched and went ahead and did this split the baby on the charges. I think that alone, I think you take out the DNA um, or have it more correctly represented and this trial would have had a completely different outcome. So I'm not sure. So Jenny, has Daniel had a post-conviction hearing? Has he been granted one? No, he was actually denied his first appeal that we've done so far, and we're currently working on his post-conviction. So that's, so Kelly, that's your answer. It's It's got to mm -hmm. go to this post-conviction hearing. I work with a lot of folks who've been wrongly convicted, and it is there that, you know, the judge really looks at what happened and all the errors, you know, that, that took place in these cases. And then the prosecutor often realizes, oh my gosh, we're going to have to just dismiss this case because, you know, we're not going to win this. And so I think that's what Jenny, you, you all are hoping for, we're all hoping for, is that there will actually be a post-conviction hearing um, where the truth can come out and the evidence can be shown and this information with the flawed forensics, with the AVL, um, all of that should be clearly addressed in, in that post-conviction hearing. And I think that's really what the goal should be for everybody at this point um, yeah, that's sitting here. So um, you have to let us know when, when you're ready for that. And hopefully we can get enough people to, to say we need to have this happen. Absolutely. And, and Brian, given that you've done 32 episodes now on this case, uh, Eloise wants to know, when are you going to finish your podcast? If well, there is an end date. <laughs> there is. And it's actually already been uh, produced and it's ready. A lot of people don't realize this, but when I got to the point that the podcast is at, uh, we were actually up to accuser S, uh, I'm sorry, up to uh, accuser, who was it? Um, 
uh, I think SE, uh, no, I'm sorry, SH is who we got to. Um, mm -hmm. I started getting subpoenas from the, the prosecutors in the federal civil trial, the, the, the lawyers representing the accusers. My podcast was revealing so much evidence that the public had not heard. Some of it had not even be heard at trial that was pointing to Daniel's uh, innocence that they started subpoenaing me. They wanted all of my records. They wanted everything that I had. Uh, they wanted all those sorts of things. And then they promised that they would continue to subpoena me to federal court for every single episode that I released from that point on. So I decided at that point, I had to put the podcast on hold. Once the civil uh, trial is resolved, then the podcast will will end. And there's, you've never seen a podcast that goes this deep uh, into, a, into a case and it covers everything. And I post every single police report. And what I tell people is it, it's told from the perspective of the uh, prosecution, but with the scrutiny of the defense. So I think people enjoy it. If they enjoy what they've heard so far, they'll love that. Well, and Brian, as a journalist myself, it's got to feel good when they when they come after you because it means you're doing something right. I, or, I, was, hurt, I was hurting them. I was exactly. presenting stuff that immediately after I would present it, they would FOIA to try to get the exact same stuff. Exactly. And when they couldn't get it, they thought, well, we'll just go after Brian and we'll make him present everything. And, and, I, and I'm go not going to do it that way. I'm not going to give you my stuff. I'd be like, go ahead. If it's going to help get an innocent man out of prison, take yeah. all you want. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's yeah. no point. And so I'm hoping. So I, you know, we're, we've got another 20, about 23 episodes that have already been produced. And as soon as this civil case is over, they'll all be published. So that's almost 75 or over 50. It'll be, it'll be about 60 total episodes by the time it's done. I don't know. There aren't many podcasts out there on a single topic, but when you're dealing with 13 accusers, honestly, 20 accusers, actually, um, only 13 made it to trial. Of those 13, only eight ended in conviction. So people need to understand 60% of Daniel's accusers were either not believed by police or were not believed by the jury. 60%. Wow. So Dr. Jackson and Jenny, what is in store for everybody next week? I believe we have um, former Indiana State Trooper David Cam, who's going to be joining us. Um, Mr. Cam was wrongly convicted for the murder of his wife and, and his two young children. And um, I, I invited him to come speak with us. So hopefully that's going to happen um, and talk about how a police officer, you know, is, is, I guess a narrative is created that a police officer committed such a heinous crime and how that would apply to Daniel and how he managed in prison as well knowing that he's an innocent man. Jenny, and Jenny, talk? and Jenny, you've been talking to Daniel and he's going to be in episode or session four with us. Um, have you been telling him a, a little bit about what we've been doing here the last two weeks? Yeah. And he's really excited um, and, and very grateful to have this opportunity to be able to tell his story. Um, and anytime that we have a chance to, you know, give um, the people more information or at least get them to want to learn more, you know, Daniel has been very open about this from the very beginning. He wants all eyes on the case. You know, um, he wants you to dig in and, and make your own opinion, not what was on media, you know, but actually digging in and looking at the actual evidence that, um, that is available out there for the public. Well, Dr. Jackson, Jenny, Erica, and Brian, thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Crime HQ for session number two of Did They Do It with Dr. Nikki Jackson and the Daniel Holscott case. And we have so much more to dive into in the next, uh, the third week and the fourth week. So if you haven't done so already, catch up on Brian's uh, podcast, which might be kind of hard to do given the number of episodes between now and next week. Uh, but, but please do take a listen. And of course, all the case files that Jenny has gathered together are posted in Crime HQ as well for you to start uh, diving into and posting your comments as well. Thank you everybody so much uh, for your time this evening and we will see you all next week. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Good night you everybody. Bye.